You're going to do in one take or multiple cuts in between? I think I'm going to do, it's going to be one take for the audio. Mm -hmm. And then I'm just going to use the footage where it looks like I'm actually talking to the camera. Oh. And then use footage of other stuff everywhere else. Okay. Make sense? Yeah. Sound good? All right. Did you start it? Yeah, I think so. Macroeconomics is a specific branch of economics that deals with the economy, the study of choices, and everything as a whole. Everything includes employment, gross domestic product, inflation, economic growth, labor, and the distribution of income. And in this episode, it's all about unions, what they are, their history, and their importance. Now, unions are important because they do two things. Promote legislation that affects pay levels and working conditions, and acts as a force in the economy. Without unions, you would probably still be working 14-hour um, shifts surrounded by dangerous machinery for the total of $2 an hour, which wouldn't be very fun, trust me. Now, people saw this and decided it wasn't right. It wasn't fair to them, to any of them, and unions were the result. This became the battle for safe conditions and equal pay, and it started all back in the 1700s. However, in the beginning, there were no unions. None. Nothing. No representation through the civilian labor force. Workers were abused, worked in filthy holes, and had no say at all. This all changed in 1778, when printers in New York City joined together to fight the unfair pay levels. This was the very first attempt, the beginning of a 236 year long war. Essentially, it all started from here. Soon, small organized unions of shoemakers, carpenters, and tailors developed, all hoping to get organized and higher pay, less working hours and better conditions. Unfortunately, only an extremely small percent of the workforce belonged to unions, and they were typically skilled workers who had some strong bargaining power. Now, shortly after this, in the 1820s, there came a huge influx of immigrants who began to make up a huge percent of the labor force. And I st have to stop. Damn it. Because I edited it. How do I just view it? I'm sorry. It's cool. Can I make it? Oh. Turn. Thank you. Wow, this thing's actually pretty long. You think he'll accept only one video? <laughs> Instead of all four sections? I can write the scripts for all four sections, but I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. I think anything like going above and beyond is like good for him. Like anything that's like different from the normal poster. Even the normal poster is good enough for him. It's Peralta. All right, man. I will. Uh, I will hope for the best there. All right, let's do it. One more time. Is it still recording? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Macronomics is the study of. Uh, damn it! Let me just go again. Is it macronomics or macroeconomics? It's macroeconomics. Macroeconomics. Sorry. It's all right. No, that. It's all right. I'm used to an, a show that calls it macroflation, which is just completely just messes with me. So, macroeconomics is a specific branch of economics that deals with the economy, the study of choices, and everything as a whole. Everything includes employment, gross domestic product, inflation, economic growth, labor, and the distribution of income. And this episode is all about unions, what they are, their history, and their importance. Now, unions do two things. They promote legislation that affects pay levels and working conditions and acts as a force in the economy. Without unions, you would probably be working 14-hour days uh, surrounded by dangerous machinery for the total of $2 an hour, which wouldn't be very fun, trust me. Now, people saw this and decided it wasn't right. It wasn't fair to them, to any of them, and the unions were the result. This became the, the battle for safe conditions and equal pay, and it all started back in the 1700s. However, in the beginning, there were no unions, none, nothing, no representation through the civilian labor force. Workers were abused, worked in fil filthy holes, and had no say. This all changed in 1778, when printers in New York City joined together to fight the unfair pay levels. This was the very first attempt. 
the beginning of a 236 year long war. Essentially, it all started from here. Soon, small organized shoe unions of shoemakers, carpenters, and tailors developed, all hoping to get higher pay, less working hours, and better conditions. Unfortunately, only an extremely small percent of the workforce belonged to unions, and they were typically skilled workers who had little to strong bargaining power. Now, shortly around this time, around 1820, there came a huge influx of immigrants who began to make up a huge percentage of the workforce. They supplied cheap, unskilled labor and threatened wage and labor standards. Labor organizers began to be thought of as troublemakers, the shoe-throwing, window-breaking hooligans of the era. It was during the Civil War when the sour attitude towards unions began to change. The war led to higher prices, a greater demand for goods and services, and a shortage of workers. Industry exploded. All of a sudden, industrial jobs made up one-fourth of the working population. Essentially, here, the labor force began to be more organized. By the end of the war, two types of unions existed. The first one was the craft union or trade union. Now, these guys were skilled. They were skilled workers who could perform the same kind of work. The other type was the industrial union. These guys represented all the workers of the same industry regardless of the job. Because a lot of people were unskilled and couldn't join trade unions, they settled for second best and represented the, themselves in industrial unions instead. And here is where both sides began to grow their teeth. Around this time, the union developed strategies like the strike, where employees could refuse to work and, until certain demands were met. Another was the picket, or parade in front of the employ employer's business carrying signs ab about the dispute. Another was the boycott, a mass refusal to buy products from targeted employers or companies. Now, employers had retaliation strategies as well. The biggest strategy that employers used was called the lockout, which was a refusal to let employees work until management demands were met. These often resulted in violence where employees clashed with troops and police officers and several people often got hurt. Now, jump forward to the Roaring Twenties where swing was king and everybody was unemployed. That's right, the Great Depression, the greatest time of economic decline in United States history. One in four workers were without a job and the average manufacturing wage was 55 cents an hour. The entire economic, the entire economic debacle changed the attitudes towards labor unions once again. Four years later, wages dropped dramatically to only five cents an hour. Talk about poverty. All of a sudden, union promoters renewed their efforts to reorganize. And new legis legislation helped that. The Norris LaGuardia Act of 1932 prevented federal courts from issuing rulings against unions engaged in strikes, picketings, or boycotts. The Wagner Act of 1935 established the right to collectively bargain. The Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938 applies to businesses that engage in interstate commerces and fixes a federal minimum wage. Unfortunately, by the end of World War II, public opinion shifted again. People believed communists were entered the unions, and more people were upset by the lack of production due to strikes. This led to an entire age of anti-union legislation, including the Labor Management Retaliation Act of 1947, which puts a limit on unions and what they can do in disputes. It gave employers the right to sue unions for breaking contracts and prohibited them from making membership a condition for hiring. It also passed right-to-work laws. Now, a right-to-work law was essentially a state law making it illegal to force workers to join a union, even though it may have already existed within a company. However, the battle for unions and the rights of workers is still ongoing, even today. Wherever there are workers in unfair conditions, there are people rallying behind the idea of unions and getting what they deem to be what they deserve. And the battle will continue for decades and centuries to come. All we can do is wait and see what finds out and what comes out of it. Or maybe rally together and change what they think is, we think is unfair to us. Damn, that is a mouthful. That was nice.